So anyways, uh, let's get started. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, for the sake of clarity, um, I'll give the following definition. Um, so an independent set is a set of vertices of a graph that have no edges between any two vertices of the set. Uh, these are also known as stable sets. Uh, the independent set problem, um, it's we're given a graph G and we're asked uh, to find the largest independent set in G. Uh, there's a generalization of this, the weighted independent set problem. Um, uh, the vertices of the graph now have weights on them determined by some weight function W. Uh, and now the problem is we're given a graph G and we want to find an independent set of largest weight. <clears throat> All right, um, so independent set, it's a fundamental problem. It was one of CARP's 21 MP complete problems. Um, so given that the general problem is hard, um, what we want to know now is for what graph classes is independent set tractable on. All right. So um, in general, there's uncountably many graph classes. So uh, let's try and make this problem a little bit easier for ourselves. And let's only consider graph classes that are defined by a finite number of forbidden induced subgraphs. And uh, in this domain, there's only countably many graph classes like this. All right. Um, so uh, in other words, uh, the question that I'm asking is, uh, when is the independent set problem on uh, fancy H-free graphs tractable, where fancy H is a finite set of graphs? Uh, so during this talk, um, this uh, fancy H letter, uh, it will refer to a finite set of graphs. And a uh, regular looking H uh, will refer to just a single graph. All right, so uh, it turns out that there is an easy reduction to show that for the large majority of uh, fancy H-free graphs, uh, graph classes, uh, the problem remains MP-complete. Um, so let me actually give you that reduction right now. It's, it's very simple. Um, so it was observed by Alexeyev in uh, 1982 that if we subdivide uh, an edge twice, that increases the maximum independent set size of the graph by exactly one. And also it is known that independent set remains hard on graphs with max degree three. All right, so starting with the graph G of max degree three, um, where we know that independent set on such graphs is hard, we subdivide the edges many times uh, to get a new graph G prime. Uh, so by many, I just mean some large multiple of two. Uh, so if G has an independent set of size K, um, then G prime has an independent set of size K plus C, um, where C is determined by how many times we've subdivided um, the edges of G. All right, so the complexity of solving the problem on G is the same as solving it on G prime. But now in our new graph G prime, uh, all the cycles are very long and all vertices of degree three are very far apart in our graph. All right, so uh, what does that give us? Well, uh, for a finite set of graphs, uh, fancy H, this new graph uh, G prime then avoids, assuming that we subdivide it enough times, any graph H and fancy H that has at least one of these following three properties. Uh, so one, if H has a vertex of degree more than three, um, and that is just because that uh, since G was assumed to be a graph with max degree three, then of course um, G prime will not uh, will avoid H. Um, two, uh, if H has two vertices of degree three and the same connected component. Um, then G prime is going to avoid H. And that is since uh, two vertices of degree three in G prime uh, must be further apart than any two vertices of degree three in H. 
Um, and the third possible condition is that um, if H has a cycle, um, then G prime will avoid H. And that is since uh, any induced cycle in G prime will be longer than any induced cycle in H. All right, so um, actually the only graphs that don't meet at least one of these three conditions um, are graphs that are forests of paths and subdivided claws. All right, so uh, what this gives us is that independent set is MP complete on the class of fancy H free graphs. If no graph in fancy H is a forest of paths and subdivided claws. Um, so in other words, as long as uh, fancy H does not contain a force that looks like this right here, um, then we know that the problem is MP complete, right? Just by this simple reduction that I gave. All right. Um, so here is a, a little bit of problem background. So um, the complexity of independent set on fancy H free graphs, where fancy H contains a forest of paths and subdivided clause is a well-known open problem. Um, here's a summary of some of the more significant advancements in this area. So it's been known since uh, the 1980s that independent set is polynomial time for P4 free graphs and claw free graphs. Um, in 2004, uh, Alexeyev gave a polynomial time algorithm for the maximum independent set on fork free graphs. Uh, and a fork is just a claw with one of its edges subdivided a single time. In 2008, this was uh, generalized by Lozen and Milinik uh, to also work for a maximum weight independent set, right? So Alexeyev's algorithm didn't work for the weighted version Lozen and Milinix does work for the weighted version. Uh, next, uh, Lokshnov et al. in 2014 gave a polynomial time algorithm for the uh, maximum weight independent set problem on P5 free graphs. Um, then in 2016, Lokshnov et al. again gave a quasi polynomial time algorithm for maximum weight independent set on P6 free graphs. Uh, this was followed by Gretzek et al. in 2017, um, generalizing the framework of Lokshnov et al., um, giving a polynomial time algorithm for maximum weight independent set on P6 free graphs. Uh, then in 2019, uh, Boxo et al. gave a sub exponential time algorithm for maximum weight independent set on PK free graphs. And then lastly, we have uh, Chudnovsky et al. in 2019 uh, giving a quasi polynomial time approximation scheme for maximum weight independent set on H free graphs, where H is a forest of paths and subdivided clause. All right, so uh, our result that we will be presenting today. Um, is a quasi polynomial time algorithm for maximum weight independent set on PK free graphs. Uh, so, this is the first work to conclusively show that the weighted independent set problem on PK, on PK free graphs is not MP complete. Um, of course, assuming that uh, MP is not contained in quasi polynomial time. Um, so, like, all right, uh, this algorithm is only quasi polynomial time, it's not a polynomial time algorithm, but this result is significantly more general than any known exact polynomial time algorithm. Um, also, uh, as you'll see in this talk, this algorithm is, is very simple. It, it is much simpler than other algorithms uh, used to try and solve this problem. All right, so it has the two strengths, right, of both being very general and also being very simple. All right. Uh, so we believe that uh, the results um, that we presented so far give evidence to the following conjecture. Uh, and that conjecture is um, that independent set 
is MP complete on the class of fancy H free graphs? If no graph in fancy H is a force of paths and subdivided clause. Uh, otherwise, uh, we conjecture that all the remaining cases are NP. All right, so this, this first part of the conjecture, right, this hardness part, was that's already given by the reduction that I just gave. And uh, what this conjecture is really saying is that all the remaining cases can be solved in polynomial time. Uh, so um, furthermore, uh, a second result of ours in the same paper that I'm presenting today um, makes uh, that proving this conjecture um, more attainable. Uh, right, so what, what this uh, theorem says is that um, if we let CLK denote the claw with each of its three edges subdivided exactly k times, um, then what this theorem says is that in order to prove uh, this conjecture, at least up to poly quasi polynomial runtime, is that it suffices to prove that independent set is quasi polynomial time on CLK free graphs. And so as long as we can prove that, um, then this conjecture uh, replacing P here with quasi polynomial uh, would be settled. All right, so uh, in addition to this, um, further work of ours has yielded a quasi polynomial time algorithm for the maximum weight independent set problem on graphs with no induced cycles of length k or more. Okay, so uh, let me explicitly state the result um, that we attain. And that is for every integer k, the maximum weight independent set on pk free graphs has an algorithm with a running time of n raised to the big O of k squared times the third power of log of n, right? Where n is the number of vertices in our graph. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to be making the simplifying assumption that our graph is unweighted. So I'm just going to be solving the unweighted version of this problem. Um, but the same ideas apply to solving the weighted version, just some minor modifications of the algorithm. All right. Uh, so let me uh, start off really just by giving you a basic idea of, of what the algorithm is. And, and you'll see that it really is quite simple. All right, so there's, uh, there's really just two or three things that the algorithm does, depending on how you view it. Um, so one thing it does is that it collects balanced separators. Um, the, the other thing that it does is that it branches on vertices with many neighbors contained in at least a few of the collected balanced separators, or it has at least a few neighbors contained in many of the collected balanced separators. And the last thing really that it does is that it solves the problem on connected components uh, once the components get small enough, right? So I, I mean, like this, this really is it. Like this is what the algorithm does. Uh, I'm like not, there's not any fancy reduction rules or anything like that that I'm sweeping under the table. Really, there's, there's really just these, these three core ideas. Um, as we will see, the main effort really goes into the choice of vertex on which to branch on. Um, and then proving that uh, this branching actually quickly disconnects the graph, right? <clears throat> All right, um, so there's a few definitions that I need to give before we can really um, go in depth into the algorithm, so. Uh, let me just give these to you. Uh, so our first definition is a C balanced separator. Uh, so a C balanced separator of a graph G is a set S such that no connected component of G minus S has over C vertices. Um, so now actually uh, the number of vertices divided by four balanced separators um, these are going to be the balanced separators that our algorithm collects, right? So in that previous slide, I said that one of the things our algorithm does is it collects balanced separators, 
right? Uh, and in fact, the kind of balanced separators that it collects are the number of vertices of G divided by four balanced separators. Right, so um, intuitively what these balanced separators look like are these are like sets S such that no component of G minus S has over one fourth of the vertices of G. Right, so these, these in particular are the kind of balanced separators that we are concerned about um, in this algorithm. Uh, all right, so definition number two that we need to give is that of a vertex multifamily. Um, uh, so a family that is just a set of sets, right? So a family is a set of sets. Um, the elements of the set themselves are sets. Uh, and now for the definition of what we are calling a vertex multifamily, um, we will always be denoting a vertex multifamily by F in this talk, right? So a vertex multifamily F, um, it is a multifamily, meaning that repetition of the elements are allowed, right? So it is, it is a multifamily of vertex sets of a graph G. Right? And this vertex multifamily F, this is what we use to hold our balanced separators that we collect. Um, and then here down the bottom, we just have a little example of what a vertex multifamily looks like. All right, so F here, um, it consists of uh, the set AB, um, comma, ACD, and then AB again. All right, so you notice that AB here is repeated. This is a multifamily, so we allow repetitions of our sets. All right. Okay. Uh, moving on, we have a um, next definition, level sets. Uh, so we define the ith level set with respect to F, again, where F is a vertex multifamily. Um, and we denote, we denote the set by capital L, open parenthesis, F comma I, close parenthesis, right? So the ith level set with respect to F, it consists of all vertices contained in at least I sets of F. Um, and these level sets, um, these are what we use to guide our branching, right? We use these to determine what vertices we're going to branch on. Um, so here, here's a quick example again. So uh, we have our vertex multifamily F from the previous slide, right? And then immediately below that, we have the uh, first level set with respect to F. So that contains all vertices that belong to at least one set of F. Right, so that's going to be the uh, vertices A, B, C, and D. Now, this second level set with respect to F contains all vertices that belong to at least two sets of F. And that's going to be the vertices A and B. And uh, the third level set that consists of all vertices that belong to at least three sets of F. Um, and that's just going to be the vertex A. <clears throat> all right. Um, all right, so this is uh, our next definition. Um, so I've, I've already been using the word branching. Uh, so let just let me make this language precise. Um, branching on a vertex V means that we recursively call the algorithm on the instances G minus V and G minus the closed neighborhood of V. And furthermore, if A is the return of the algorithm on G minus V, and B is the return of the algorithm on G minus the closed neighborhood of V, then we return the max of A and B plus one. Uh, right, so uh, this, is, this is a very standard method for solving the independent set problem. Right. Um, all right, so that's branching. Um, intuitively, what does branching mean? Um, well, uh, intuitively, to branch on a vertex V means that we solve the problem on one instance uh, where we guess that V is not in the maximum independent set. And we solve it on another instance where we guess that V is in the maximum independent set. 
All right. <clears throat> so standard definition of branching, All right? All right, so um, let's take a little bit more in-depth look at what the algorithm does now. Um, so uh, the final output of the algorithm is, is going to be the size of the maximum independent set, right? Um, so what the algorithm does is, um, so if, if we're down to just one or zero vertices left in our graph, okay, like, okay, we're done. That's our base case, finished, great. Um, next, uh, the algorithm checks and sees are all components of size less than or equal to n divided by two. If it is true, then we solve components recursively. Um, okay, so, so what does this capital N letter mean? Um, capital N is basically a number that the algorithm uses to keep track of how much progress it has made since its last recursed on connected components. Um, so the number n starts off as the number of vertices of G, um, but as, as the algorithm goes on, it's branching our vertices, so the size of G starts to decrease while we uh, keep n the same number. Um, when we recurse on connected, when we recurse on connected components, um, we set the value of n now to be the size of the given component that we are recursing on. All right. So again, um, n is just some tool that the algorithm uses to keep track of how much progress it's made so far. Um, its its main value is really to make the analysis of the runtime of the algorithm a little bit easier. All right. So um, we we don't branch on connected components immediately. Every time we we wait until the size of the largest component is less than n divided by two. All right. So again, what so what the algorithm does, right? Uh, if the size of the largest component is greater than n divided by two, then it goes to this next step. It checks, is there a good vertex to branch on? Um, then we branch on it. Uh, so what it means for vertex to be good for branching, we will define uh, in the next slide, right? But it basically checks, it says, is there a vertex good for branching on? And it branches on it. If none of these three, none of these first three conditions hold, uh, then it's going to do something kind of smart, right? And there'll be more on this later. All right. Um, so for now, let's let's see what makes a vertex good for branching. <clears throat> All right, so um, a vertex V in a graph G is branchable with respect to a vertex uh, multiset F. Sorry, uh, yes, vertex multiset F, vertex multifamily F. Um, uh, if there exists um, an ith level set such that this following inequality holds. Okay, so what is this inequality saying? It's this inequality is saying that um, the closed neighborhood of V contains at least the number of vertices of G divided by two to the I elements of the ith level set. All right, so if a vertex V satisfies this condition, then we say that this vertex V is branchable, or to use the language of the other side, right, this vertex V is going to be good for branching. Um, okay, so let's just try and digest um, what this inequality here is saying a little bit more. Um, so if a vertex has uh, greater than the number of vertices of G divided by two neighbors in the first level set, then that vertex is going to be branchable. Or if uh, a vertex V has more than the number of vertices of G divided by four neighbors in the second level set, then it's going to be good for branching. Uh, or if uh, the neighborhood of V contains more than the number of vertices of G divided by eight neighbors in the third level set, uh, then it's going to be branchable, right? And so on, right? Um, so note, that because we are taking the closed neighborhood here, which is important, right? So it's important to note that we're taking the closed neighborhood of V now. And because we're taking the closed neighborhood of V, that implies that all vertices in the level set log of the size or of the number of vertices of G are going to be branchable. Um, so again, so our level sets are kind of indexed by integers. So 
when you see log of something like the number of vertices of G, you can just imagine that we're rounding up whatever this number is in our head, right? So the log of the number of vertices of G level sets, right? All vertices in that level sets are going to be branchable. Oh, that's going to be an important point that we're going to come back to later. All right. Uh, so this is our definition for a branchable vertex. Um, this is going to be the most complicated definition of the talk. Um, really, it's, it's going to be the last definition also. Um, yes, so next we're going to move on to the uh, do something smart part of our algorithm. All right. I'll linger here a little bit longer in case people need some more time to uh, digest this definition. All right, um, moving on. Uh, so we're going to call this the Gyarfas lemma, right? This, is, this corresponds to that do something smart part of our, uh, our algorithm. Um, and, and really, um, the Gyarfas lemma uh, tells us like this is how we find our balanced separators, right? These um, number of vertices of G divided by four balanced separators, right? That I was talking about before. This is how we find them. Um, so uh, if, if G is a PK-free graph, um, then there exists a set X of vertices such, such that the following three properties hold. Um, the first is that the closed neighborhood of X is a number of vertices of G divided by four balanced separator. Right. Um, the second property is that the size of X is small. Right. So the size of X is at most 8K. Um, right, this, this point here is important. We're going to come back to that later again. Um, and then lastly, uh, we need X to be found in polynomial time, right? And indeed it can be, it can be found in polynomial time. Uh, so, uh, this result is a simple extension of Boxo et al, um, which itself is based on the classic Gyarfas path for an argument. Uh, so uh, the proof of uh, the original lemma and our extension of it are both uh, quite short and simple, um, but I'm going to be skipping the proof just in the interest of time. Uh, you can find the proof of our extension in our paper that I'll talk about now. Um, and our paper contains a citation to the uh, Boxo et al paper uh, that contains the original lemma. All right. Um, so, anyways, this is this is our Gyarfas lemma. We we are basically going to be using this as a subroutine in our um, in our main algorithm. All right. Um, so let's uh, let's take one last uh, heuristic look at what our algorithm does before um, we delve into the details of the algorithm. Right. Um, so um, again, intuitively, what what the algorithm does, it's a recursive algorithm um, with two two or three basic actions, and depending on how you want to count it, right? But like the the two two really core actions that the algorithm does is that uh, it recurses on connected components once those components are small enough, right? Once they're smaller than n over two, um, and it branches on a branchable vertex if one exists, right? And, and these are really the two core things that the algorithm does. Um, right, so uh, intuitively, right, the, the algorithm wants to branch in such a way um, such that the graph gets broken up into small components, right? So naturally enough, then it uses balanced separators to guide the branching. Right, as, as I've already mentioned before, right? So it, it wants to break the graph up into small components. Um, so yes, again, it's natural that it uses balanced separators to guide the branching. Uh, so more specifically, um, what the algorithm does is that it collects balanced separators using the Gyarfas lemma. It puts them into this vertex multifamily F, and it uses the level sets with respect to F to guide our branching, right? To determine 
web proxies are branchable. Um, so uh, now we are about to go explicitly into what the algorithm says. Um, is there anybody, well, actually I'll take questions after I, I give the algorithm, right? So um, let me, uh, yeah, let me just give the, the in-depth uh, discussion of what this algorithm does. So uh, for the base case, if the number, uh, so for the base case, if the number of, of vertices of G is uh, less than one, then we just return the size of this graph, right? So that's our base case, right? So now um, for case one, uh, we have that if the size of the largest connected component is at most n divided by two, then we solve the problem on each connected component and return the sum of the calls. Um, so something to note that when we recurse on connected components, uh, our vertex multifamily F, it gets reset, right? So throughout this algorithm, F is collecting balance separators. Once we recurse on connected components, we reset F. That means that we, we just set it to the empty set again, right? So we, we force F to be the empty set when we recurse on connected components. Um, and we also set N, we, we set N to be the number of vertices of the component that we are recursing on, right? Um, okay, so uh, if case one doesn't hold, then the algorithm moves on to case two. Um, and what case two does is that if there exists a branch called vertex V, um, then we branch on V. And then lastly, if case two doesn't hold, then moves on to case three. Um, and that is that it just, it adds an N over four balanced separator to F. Um, it's vertex multifamily using the Gerard plus lemma. Um, okay, so before I told you that it adds a number of vertices of G divided by four balanced separator, um, it's actually a little bit easier just for the analysis to say it adds an N over four balanced separator. Um, and we will note later on that basically throughout the algorithm, N and the number of vertices of G are always close together. So you can usually interchange um, using N or the vertices of G in most cases. So here, um, we're just going to say it adds an N over four balanced separator to F. Um, okay, so something to note here is that it, it may look like the algorithm could get stuck just like in an endless loop um, of just adding more and more balanced separators, right? Um, but this, uh, this won't happen because each time we add a balanced separator, we make more and more vertices branchable, right? So we can never add too many balanced separators in succession um, before some vertex becomes branchable. Um, also, um, so when we branch on a vertex, um, we also update uh, the balanced separators in F accordingly. Um, so we remove the vertices um, from the balanced separators in F that are also removed from G. Uh, so note that um, these sets remain balanced separators on the instances that we recurse on. Um, and, and then just one last thing to note about this algorithm is that it, it's very important that it considers these cases in this order. Right? So it's, it's important that case one is considered before case two. It's important that case two is considered before case three. All right, um, so uh, I'll stop for a second and. If anybody has a question, you can type it in the chat. And I'll, uh, I'll try to answer it. All right, um, it doesn't look like there's any questions. So um, hopefully what this algorithm is doing is clear. And I'm just going to move on to a couple of observations now. <clears throat> uh, so um, two important observations. Um, one that I already kind of noted before, uh, the, the value of n, it will lie between the number of vertices of g and two times the number of vertices of g. Um, and or else if this doesn't happen, um, then the algorithm just recurses on connected components immediately. Uh, again, so like I said before, in most places throughout this talk, it's really, it's going to be okay to interchange 
the number of vertices of G and N, um, as you've already seen me done. Uh, so um, the next thing to note, um, and this is important, is that no vertex belongs to over log N elements of F. And why is that? Well, it's because, as we already noted before, all elements in the log nth uh, level set with respect to f are branchable, right? And again, what we actually noted was the, the log of the number of vertices of g. Um, but like I said, n and g are typically interchangeable. So we, we can actually um, say that all vertices in the log nth level set with respect to f are branchable, right? And again, now this implies that no vertex belongs to over log n elements of f. All right. Um, so let's um, let's analyze the runtime now. So we're gonna we're gonna see why um, this algorithm runs in quasi polynomial time. Um, so the efficiency of the algorithm relies on on two bounds. Um, so uh, this first bound. Uh, says that the size of f, um, it never grows too large. Um, and explicitly what it says is that uh, the size of f, that's our vertex multifamily, um, it's always less than or equal to 2k times log of n. Um, okay, so intuitively why is this true? Um, that is because having a graph with a large kinetic component and many balanced separators such that no vertex belongs to over log n of them, Right, and as we noted before, no vertex belongs to over log n sets of f. Um, this implies the existence of a long path, right, which contradicts the fact that we are assuming that our graph is pk free. Um, so that's kind of like the heuristic uh, proof of why this is. Um, so the proof of bound one really is the combinatorial heart of our algorithm. Um, and we'll, we'll actually, we'll see a, a full proof of this later. It's, it's not a very hard proof. Um, but for now, we're just going to see um, why bound one together with, this, with, with the next bound we're going to see gives us quasi polynomial runtime, right? So, um, okay, so the thing to know about bound one. So bound one tells us that we never collect over 2K times log N uh, balanced separators in one branch of the recursion tree of our algorithm um, before we recurse on connected, on connected components, right? And again, when we recurse on connected components, the size of them are most n over two. Um, okay, so let's look at uh, our second bound. Uh, so what our second bound says is um, at most, uh, approximately log n times n divided by two to the i vertices get added to the ith level set. Um, and that is before we recurse on connected components. Uh, so again, I'm using approximately, it's the number is like something slightly larger than this, but it's, it's a little bit easier just to deal with this term here. Um, so again, what intuitively what this bound is giving us is that um, we never do too much work when branching, right? That's intuitively what this, what this bound gives us. Um, so, uh, why is that? Well, branching our vertices, um, sorry, br branchable vertices have at least n divided by two to the i neighbors, um, in some level set, in some ith level set. Um, that means that branching is going to make large progress on decreasing the size of the ith level set. Right, um, so, uh, to see how much work we have to do um, when branching before we completely deplete the ith level set, uh, we can analyze this following recursion that we have. Um, all right, so uh, uh, this, this function here, um, this function r, um, this function gives us how much work is done by branching um, before we completely deplete the ith level set. All right, so this algorithm, or sorry, this, this function r takes two inputs. We have uh, the number of vertices in our graph, right? The number of vertices of G. Um, and in the second input, it's the number of vertices in our ith level set. All right, so the number of vertices in our ith level set is at most 
log n times n divided by 2 to the i. Um, so uh, to see how we get this first inequality, we have to look at what happens when we branch on a branchable vertex v. Um, so this, this first term here, right? This, this first term comes from when we guess that v is not in our independent set. Right, so when it's not an independent set, we just remove v from the graph, right? Um, so this first term is saying we have r. Um, so the first input is the number of vertices of g minus one because we just removed v from our graph. Um, the second term remains unchanged, right? So the ith level set still has log of n times n divided by two to the i elements. And now plus we have the second term, which comes from our second recursive call where we guess that the vertex v is in our maximum independent set. Um, so here, uh, what this uh, term is, is that we have r of the number of vertices of g minus 1, again, because we are still removing at least v. Um, and then comma, we have log n times n uh, divided by 2 to the i minus n divided by 2 to the i. Right, because we're branching on our branchable vertex v, that means that we are removing at least n divided by 2 to the i vertices in the i level set when we guess that v is in our um, when we guess that v is in our solution. Right, so that's that's how we get this first inequality here. Um, now this the second inequality um, that follows just from applying this first inequality to this first term here again many times, right? The number of vertices of g times. Right? So this, this first term here, we, we basically unroll this first term, um, applying this first inequality, the number of vertices of g times to this first term. And then that gives us this second bound of um, the number of vertices of g uh, times r um, of the number of vertices of g minus 1 comma log of n times n divided by 2 to the i minus n divided by 2 to the i. Um, OK, now again, taking this second inequality and applying it log n times to this term here. Right, So we apply this second inequality to this term here, log of n times. Um, well, you can see that that will completely deplete uh, at the ith level set. Right, This term here will be 0. And applying this inequality log of n times um, gives us uh, some term of big O of n to the log n. Right, so um, applying the second inequality log n times gives us this bound of n uh, to the log n work done by branching uh, before it depletes the ith level set. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, so um, so we saw, right, as we just saw, right, branching efficiently depletes all level sets, um, of which there are most log n non-empty level sets. Um, so um, branching does at most big O of n to the log squared n work um, before it depletes all of the level sets. And once all the level sets are depleted, we're guaranteed that we're going to be recursing on connected components. Because right, then that means that we've totally depleted at least one balance separator of f. You know, so once all level sets are depleted, um, we must be recursed on, on connected components of size at most n divided by two. Um, okay, so let me let me clarify a little bit what I mean by work. Um, so um, when I when I say work, uh, what I mean by work is that. Um, if, if we look at the recursion tree of our algorithm and we look at any subtree of this recursion tree where all of the nodes of this subtree correspond to instances um, where the algorithm either branched on a branch bell vertex or it added a balance separator, but it did not recurse on connected components, um, right? Then what this recursion is really telling us is that the size of this subgraph. Um, or subtree, right, of a recursion tree, is at most big O of n to the log squared of n. 
All right, again, so if, if we look at any piece of the recursion tree where all the nodes correspond to events where it, it did not recurse on kinetic components, right, then we have this n raised to log squared n bound on the number of, of nodes in this recursion tree. Right, and then once it does, once it does branch kinetic components, then all of a sudden now we're solving a problem where the size of n dropped by two, right? So we're, we're basically cutting in half the size of our problem. Um, and that gives us then that the total work or the total number of nodes in our recursion tree um, is big O of n to the log uh, of the third power of n. Um, and again, it's easy to go back and look at our algorithm and see that in every, uh, in every um, instance of the algorithm, right? Uh, it's only doing polynomial work. So we do polynomial work and then we branch or recursively call something, polynomial work, recursively call something. Um, right, and that, that gives us this quasi polynomial bound. Okay. Um, all right. So that's it for the runtime. Um, let's, uh, let's just look at the proofs of these two bounds. Right, and then that'll be basically it. Once, once we understand the proofs of these two bounds, then that's essentially it for the algorithm, right? That, that proves everything that there is to really prove about this algorithm. Uh, so uh, we have uh, bound one proof, right? So the lemma, uh, again, so let's recall what bound one says. It's that the size of our vertex multifamily F um, is never too big. And specifically what that means is that the size of F is always less than or equal to 2k times log of n. Um, okay, so let's let's just see the proof. Again, it's not too hard. Um, so as we already saw, um, no vertex belongs to over log n balance separators uh, of f. So our proof is going to be by, con by contradiction. Um, so if the size of f is greater than 2k times log of n, um, then the size of the largest connected component, C, of our graph G, um, is greater than n divided by 2. Uh, and why is that? Well, if it wasn't true, um, then we would have recursed on connected components, right? Uh, so if, if the size of our largest connected component was less than n over 2, that means that all of our connected components are size less than n over 2. And that means that uh, our algorithm would have recursed on connected components. And then it would have reset f, right? So f would actually be the empty set. Uh, if this were the case, right? Um, but f, f is not the empty set. F is um, some large collection of balanced separators. So because f is some large collection of balanced separators, um, we know that c, besides the largest connected component, must be large as well, right? Greater than n over 2. Um, so furthermore, um, we have that every balanced separator of f is an n over 4 balanced separator for g. And since C is of size greater than n over 2, this tells us that every balanced separator uh, of F is a number of vertices of C divided by 2 balanced separator for C. Um, uh, so this is telling us that any set S in F, um, that for, for any set S in F, right, at most half of the vertices of C um, can belong to a single connected component of C minus S. Okay, um, so we're going to try and use this observation to get a contradiction. Uh, so this next part of the proof is uh, uses some basic um, probabilistic methods. Uh, so um, we have that uh, for balanced separator uh, for balanced separators S and F. Um, there is at most a 50% chance that two randomly selected vertices of C are in the same component, are in the same connected component uh, in C minus S. Or again, no connected component of C minus S contains more than half of the vertices of C. So if we randomly pick two vertices of C, um, there's at most a 50% chance that both of them will belong to the same connected component of C minus S. Um, so, um, by linearity of expectation, uh, there must be two vertices, uh, A and B and C, that are separated um, by half of the vertices of F, uh, which is k times log n uh, separators of F. Um, 
So we're going to call this set of k times log n separators f prime. Um, all right, so what we have is that we have a bunch of separators s and f prime, uh, none of which place a and b in the same kinetic component of c minus s. Uh, so it is possible uh, that a or b or both a and b uh, could belong to s. All right, that's fine. Um, all right, so the contradiction is going to be derived just in this next uh, point right here. Um, so what we have then is that uh, for any path between a and b, uh, each set of f prime must contain at least one vertex of this path. Right? Um, or else a and b would be in the same component of c minus s, right? which is contradicting how we chose the balanced separators in f prime. Right, so uh, if a path uh, from A to B contains less than k vertices, um, then some vertex on this path must belong to over log n separators of f prime. Right, so if there's if there's any short path between A and B, um, then that means that uh, there's some vertex in this path belongs to over log n vertices of f prime. Um, but this contradicts the fact that no vertex can belong to over log n separators of f. Um, so then now what we have is that every path uh, from A to B is actually long. It's more than k vertices. Um, but we already know that A and B both belong to the connected component C. Um, and we're saying, they so they must have some path between each other, but we're saying all of them are greater than k, which means that there is some induced path of length more than k between A and B. And that contradicts our assumption now that G is pk free. Right, and then, all right, so going back, right, now we, we get contradiction with this original assumption that f, right, the size of our vertex multifamily is more than 2k times log of n. All right, so, okay, we got a contradiction that proves the bound, right, that the size of our vertex multifamily f is at most 2k times log of n. All right, um, so that's the bound of proof one, right, not too bad, right, the bound of proof two is even easier. All right, so uh, recall what, what, uh, what bound two says. Bound two says that at most, um, approximately log of n times n divided by 2 to the i vertices um, ever get added to the ith level set um, before we recurse on kinetic components, right? So in between recursing on kinetic components, um, at most log of n times n divided by 2 to the i vertices get added to the ith level set. This is what bound two says. Um, so, uh, okay, to, to see why this holds, um, first note that no vertex has over n divided by 2 to the i minus 1 neighbors in the i minus 1 level set when a new balance separator is added to f. Right, and that's because, well, if such a vertex did meet this condition, then that vertex would be branchable. Right, so because we check, is there a branchable vertex before we add a uh, balance separator? Um, we know that there's never any branchable vertices when we add a balanced separator, um, in which case no such vertex uh, like this exists. Um, well, again, we also have the fact from the Gyarfas lemma, right, that all balanced separators added to f, they are the neighborhood of the most 8k vertices. Okay, so, so what does that give us? Um, that means that new vertices added to the i level set. Um, so, well, okay, so new vertices added to the i-th level set, they must have already belong to the i minus 1th level set before that new balance separator is added, right? Um, okay, so combining uh, these three observations, right, we have then that no more than 8k, right, that's the number of vertices uh, of x, right? Uh, sorry, so, so no more than, uh, no more than 8k times n divided by two to the i minus one vertices uh, are added to the ith level set each time a balance separator is added. Right, our, ba our balance separator is the neighborhood of the most 8k vertices. Um, no vertex sees more than n divided by two to the i neighbors in the i, in the I minus one level set. So when we add a new balance separator, at most 8k times n divided by two to the i minus one vertices are added to the ith level set right, each time a balance separator is added. And our first bound gives us that at most 2k times log n balance separators are added in total. 
Um, so altogether, this gives us that at most uh, 16k squared times log of n times n divided by 2 to the i minus 1 vertices are added in total. Right? And again, the, the term k here, that's, that's the length. Uh, we're, we're assuming our graph is pk free, right? So um, hopefully that's clear, right? This, this k is coming from pk free graphs, right? We're assuming our input is a pk free graph. That's where k comes from. Um, all right, so um, lastly, uh, I'm, I'm going to end this just with a visual depiction, right? So if, um, if that last uh, proof of Banach wasn't easy enough for you, wasn't clear enough, here's a, here's a picture of what is going on, right? So when we add a new balance separator, um, we are taking, we are adding at most 8K times N divided by 2 to the I vertices from the i-th level set to the i plus 1th level set. Right, so this is a visual depiction of kind of what these level sets look like, right? They decrease exponentially in size. Um, and each time we take vertices from the i-th level set and we add some more to the i plus 1th level set. <clears throat> All right. Um, so uh, that's. Uh, brings me to the conclusion, right? So um, basically, I mean, we, we hit all the key points uh, in our algorithm here, and we proved all of them, right? except for the gear alpha lemma, which isn't too hard, right? And like I said, if, if you're really curious, um, you can look at our paper for the extension of the gear alpha lemma, and we have a citation to uh, Boxo et al. Um, if you want to see the original lemma. Um, but okay, this brings us to our conclusion, right? So, uh, so what we saw was a quasi-polynomial time algorithm for a maximum weight independent set on PK through graphs. Um, so key things raise right, that um, this provides evidence towards the conjecture that independent set is MP complete on the class of uh, fancy H free graphs if no graph in fancy H is a forest of paths and subdivided clause. And otherwise, we conjecture that for all remaining cases, um, independent set can be solved in polynomial time. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, as I already noted before, right? In order to prove this conjecture that we have here, up to at least a quasi-polynomial runtime, it suffices to prove uh, that independent set is quasi-polynomial time for CLK-free graphs. Again, where CLK-free, where CLK graphs are clause with its arms of length uh, k plus one. All right, so that's it uh, for the talk. Thank you uh, for coming here. And, and thank uh, you very much. Maybe there could be some questions, please. Yes. Yes, doesn't look like there are any questions. Then thank you once again for the talk, for a nice talk. Yes. Yeah, thanks uh, for coming. Thanks for having me. Bye.